Midwinter's Day, Winter Solstice, Yule, Christmas, whatever you like to call it. Hello, my friends. Welcome back to this series of videos I'm doing on the Wheel of the Year. So, the days have been getting steadily shorter and shorter since summer solstice, those heady days of high summer. The sun has been arcing lower and lower and lower in the sky. And if you're in Northern Europe, particularly, you know, the tip of Scotland or Scandinavia, it's almost disappearing below the horizon, plunging us possibly into perpetual darkness for the rest of time. On about the 20th or 21st of December, the sun seems to be still in the sky. Solstice, that's what it means, sun standing still. For three days, three days, things continue like that. The sun not rising nor dipping. Things are on a knife edge. Then, three days later, on around the December the 24th or 25th, the sun steadily starts to rise in the sky. The days get longer and longer. It's as if the sun has been reborn and summer is back on its way. <laughs> so, <clears throat> December the 24th then, the day for the birth or rebirth of the sun, aka Son of God, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour. However, as you probably guessed by now, these days are based on much earlier pagan traditions. So if you're familiar with any of my Wheel of the Year videos, you'll be familiar with the um, eight-fold division in the Wheel of the Year. Hang on. Here's uh, a demonstration made by my partner Tamsin, burned on wood. So we've got the um, summer solstice up here. We're at the other point of the year now. You. <laughs> so, Yule is just an old proto-Germanic word for, uh, well, we don't really know what it means, but it means sort of feast or uh, gathering, probably. Uh, if you've been watching these Wheel of the Year videos, uh, I talk about the solstices and the equinoxes, uh, but also the cross-quarter days that divide them, so that's eight in total. Some people say this is more of a contemporary pagan thing and the cross-quarter days are more Celtic and the solstices and the equinoxes are more uh, Germanic. It's kind of true, but the origins of particularly this day, the winter solstice, are ancient and way older than Celtic or Germanic speaking peoples even existed on these islands or anywhere else in Europe, okay? Much older than that. For example, Stonehenge probably the most well-known megalithic monument in, well, Europe, certainly, possibly the world, uh, that is aligned on the summer and winter solstices. The axes are very important for the summer and winter solstice. People, druids and other seekers, gather there in winter solstice and summer solstice, but in ancient times, winter solstice was probably the more important of the two. We can tell that by looking at deposits of huge feasting that happened on that day. So clearly the sun coming back was very important to these early agricultural people. There's more meanings and significances uh, with, with Stonehenge relating to this day that I'll get onto, aka this being a day of the dead and the ancestors. So this idea of, of waiting for the sun to return, a very ancient one that we can trace right back to the megalith builders, our predecessors on these islands. Another example might be the uh, tomb of New Grange in Ireland, a passage tomb, a uh, very, very deep passage tomb, uh, again, a, a place of burial, a place of the dead. But the, uh, the, the, the sun on winter solstice illuminates the very back of that chamber. It's a liminal space, liminal space is like a doorway space, an in-between space. If you're familiar with my videos, again, that's often associated in the Celtic worldview with Samhain, with Halloween. I'm sure you've heard this, it's one of the thin times when 
spirits of the other side, spirits of the dead and spirits of the, of the she, the, the fairies, can cross over. In fact, in some Celtic traditions, the spirits of the dead are walking abroad. I don't mean like to Spain, I mean, you know, among us, <laughs> from Samhain to winter solstice. So the, 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 the dead are, are sort of uh, on the Raven Road, poetically speaking, the Crow Road. Are on this great journey, and then on winter solstice, boom, they go back beneath the burial mounds, back beneath the she mounds. It's a sort of fusion of lots of different Celtic and Germanic beliefs, this idea. Um, but that's also why the wild hunt, the spectral hunt, is particularly important at this time of year. Odin, the Norse god Odin, is associated with Yule. Hearn, the hunter, uh, one of the lords of the spectral hunt is associated with this time of year. This is a time of endings. The old astronomical year has ended. Uh, and a new year, a new sun is being reborn. It's so interesting how the Christian mythos, the idea of the little baby boy being reborn on this day, uh, I find it so interesting that in English this synchronicity, this kind of coincidence of language, that the word sun, solar sun, and sun as in child, is the same word in English. The sun is reborn on the winter solstice. Of course, this is a much older idea than Christianity. There are many gods that are born on uh, around the winter solstice, or three days later when the sun starts rising in the sky again, around the 25th of December. Mithras being one example in the ancient world. There's a Roman temple of Mithras in the north of Britain. He was sort of a precursor to Jesus, a uh, deity of salvation who would grant you immortal life, um, kind of like a solar deity. Uh, he was born in human form. We don't know a lot about Mithras's mysteries, but very much like Jesus, the Egyptian Horus, uh, 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 various deities associated with this time of year uh, being born at this time of year. It's also worth mentioning, uh, now I've mentioned Mithras and the Roman Empire, the Roman pre-Christian festival of Saturnalia at this time of year. Saturn, again, being a god of old age, but also endings, and also wealth, actually, and uh, agriculture, uh, wealth from the, from the soil. Um, not an underworld deity so much, but, uh, but a very old deity to do with um, order and linear, the natural order of things and boundaries that cannot be transgressed. The, the interesting and ironic thing about Saturnalia in, in the Roman custom is all order and custom was thrown out the window because, again, it was this liminal time where the natural order of things was inverted. Masters would play servants and servants would play masters. They would be gift giving. This goes right back to the Romans and before, uh, to the Babylonians even. Um, and, and, yeah, the, the, the chaos is unleashed, a kind of happy chaos that still, I think, persists in Christmas office parties to this day. You know, those po pagan ways, pogan ways are threaded through. Um, so Saturn, 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 the god of kind of boundaries, is sort of transgressed at this time of year. Um, a very interesting idea in the uh, Roman custom of Saturnalia is the Lord of Misrule. Someone in the household is anointed the Lord of Misrule. Uh, sometimes he's kind of has ha has horns put on his head. Um, but this idea of this um, this idea of misrule and happy chaos. Uh, threading through lots of other pagan traditions as well. Um, in a lot of European traditions, there's something called mummers or uh, geysers, they're sometimes called. So we get the modern English parlance, geezer. Oh, he's a geezer, some old, strange fella. But these guys would go door to door, uh, kind of trick-or-treating almost. Again, some of the similarity between Halloween, Samhain, and winter solstice, Christmas, uh, this, this idea of dressing up to go door to door, to maybe scare away unwanted spirits, uh, but also to spread merriment and mischief. Um, so uh, wassailing is another version of this from this part of the world. Uh, you go from door to door with a big pot 
of ale and you sing a song. Uh, in this part of the world, it goes, um, Wassail, wassail all over the town. Our toast, it is white, and our ale, it is brown. Um, our bowl, it is made of the good linden tree. Um, from a wassail bowl, we'll drink unto thee. Wassail just means good health. So it's this idea of well-wishing, going from door to door, giving people a drink in exchange for money. And there's lots of versions of that in the West Country. Nice bit of mead my friend gave me here. Uh, in the West Country, there's something called the usa, so you wear a bull's head at a kind of, um, it's an old fertility symbol. It goes right back to Celtic and previous people of a sacrificial bull that is um, slaughtered at this time of year. Lots of other animals as well slaughtered this time of year. We've got goats, Yule goats in Scandinavia, we've got bulls, we've got boars. Traditionally, before turkeys, a boar's head would have been the Christmas meal. These are all uh, probably remnants of various sacrificed animals that were sacrificed probably to bring the sun back at this time of year, but also for pragmatic reasons as well. You don't want to feed your livestock through the cold winter months, uh, so it's better to sacrifice them on these various feast days, fatten yourself up, and, uh, and give them to the gods. Um, there's archaeological evidence for this as well, going way back before Celtic and Germanic people, again, to places like Stonehenge and Avebury. We can see the amount of animals that were slaughtered, lots of cattle. In some cases at Stonehenge, at winter solstice, there were so many animals just um, cooked and eaten. It must have been this amazing display, this amazing feast. And some of that livestock came all the way down from uh, the tip of Scotland. So clearly Neolithic Britain was connected in this uh, amazing, amazing um, way. A lot of the idea behind Stonehenge as well, as I've already suggested, is as a um, monument to the dead, uh, as a place of crossing over what in Tibetan religion is called kind of the bardo, the, the in-between. There was a woodhenge and a stonehenge, and there's some suggestion that as part of the funerary rite, bodies or, or ashes would be taken from woodhenge down, uh, down river, and then along an avenue, sacred avenue, to stonehenge, where they were maybe scattered or some ritual was done. So both to bring back the sun, but also as a, um, a means of immortalizing the dead or sending them on to the next life, we don't really know but something connected with the dead on this time of year. That's something that we've largely forgotten with modern um, Christmas celebrations, but, it, but it, it, going right into the medieval, this idea that, that this is also a time when, when spirits, the spirits of the dead and maybe demons might be around. Uh, so it's a good time to hunker in with your family. Just backtracking a little bit to this idea of guising and going door to door. Uh, I mentioned mummers and mummers plays, also a lot of Morris dancing. We don't know the origins of this English custom, but arguably based on an on old fertility rite. There's also versions of this in, in parts of Britain, uh, particularly in Wales, of a horse's skull. A man dressed as a, with, a, with a horse's skull mask as another version of this um, usa. Uh, and they go from door to door, and instead of singing at them and, and sharing mead, there's a poetry contest. This is a very Celtic thing, so I'm not surprised it lingers in Wales. But the horse's head man, you know, has a, they, they have a, a contest of poetry to see who can outdo the other one in terms of praise. You know, you host are the finest. No, you horse's head man, spirit of the night, are, are the greatest horse's head spirit that has ever been here, this kind of thing, but in, in poetry. And eventually the householder ideally uh, is beaten and the whole merry band are invited in for a drink and some um, plum pudding. So yeah, these remnants, these fragments of much older ideas to do with gods of the wild hunt, gods of death, but spirits of the other side. Um, I mentioned that Odin is associated with this time of year as well. It's one of the reasons why some people suggest there's a link between Odin and Santa Claus or Father Christmas. Which brings me on to these pagan-themed Christmas cards I have designed featuring Yule Man and his reindeer companion, Rudy. So, 
If you want to uh, annoy any of your Christian friends this Christmas, you can probably still order some in time for Christmas. They're taking inspiration from the horned god here. There's a few different designs and they're also available in cup form from my Redbubble store. I'll put a link in the description if you're interested. Which brings me on to Old Man Winter or the personification of this time of year. In Scandinavia, uh, Santa Claus or Father Christmas is still actually called Yule Man. It's like a feast man, solstice man. Um, I've made a video about the various pagan influences in the uh, contemporary image of Santa Claus. I'll put a link to it. I say um a lot in the video, so maybe count how many times I say um in the video and, and leave a comment. But yeah, uh, this figure in Britain, we call him Father Christmas or Old Man Winter. He used to be called some in some places Old Man Holly or the Holly King. So that again brings us back to pre-Christian ideas. The Holly and the Ivy, very, very important pagan symbols of uh, everlasting life because of course they're evergreen. I made a video about holly a couple of weeks ago, the red berries of the holly symbolizing the sacrifice today of Jesus Christ, but previously of perhaps whatever animal was being sacrificed or even, this is an old idea, uh, James Fraser talks about this in The Golden Bough, but perhaps a king or aristocrat would be willingly sacrificed the land to bring a good harvest next year um, because the, the king is intimately connected to the, both the land and the cosmos. It's a macrocosm, microcosm thing. Uh, the ivy is the female aspect of the male holly. Also, the mistletoe. Still kissing under the mistletoe. This is ancient. The white berries of the mistletoe, by the way, probably represent um, um, uh, semen, so a male fertility aspect. Uh, I've also had it suggested that the red berries sometimes fertilize, symbolize the female fertility aspect, you know, menstrual blood. Uh, getting a bit graphic there, but I, I've heard those theories. I'm not sure quite how much of that we can be absolutely sure about from a historical point of view, but the symbology makes sense. Uh, but mistletoe certainly has been revered by our ancestors for a very long time. The Romans noted that the Druids would cut uh, mistletoe, sometimes with a golden sickle. Uh, they didn't mention the time of year, but uh, I would have a healthy suspicion that it would be around the winter solstice. So yeah, that's why mistletoe is still associated with this time of year, and it was a fertility symbol then and now. That's what the kissing under the mistletoe is um, all about. Holly as well features in the story of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. I'll put a link to that story. I've told it on this channel before. But uh, very, very pagan influences in this Christian story of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. Uh, but, but the Green Knight, when he strides into King Arthur's hall at Christmas time, he's holding a sprig of holly, which he throws down, because the Green Knight is kind of the personification of the holly king of winter, death and uh, intransiability, but also rebirth. Green symbolizes death and rebirth and, and evergreen. So how would we celebrate uh, Christmas or Yule if we want to kind of lean into the old ways a little bit? Uh, well, there's lots of ways, but I think, I, think the, I think our Christmas celebration as we have it today already retains quite a lot of the pagan stuff. So much, actually, that a lot of Christian denominations like Jehovah's Witnesses won't even celebrate it. Um, sometimes I get Christians on this channel that want to kind of be combative about various things I'm saying. Um, I've got no beef with Christianity. So all of you guys, you know, I forgive you. <laughs> I love you. If I was a Christian in the traditional sense, I would view the pagan ways that feed into Christianity as part of the same story. It's also as, almost as if God has kind of laid the table with all these pagan ideas, uh, only to kind of crown it off with Christianity 2,000 years ago. That's not my view, but I think that's a totally valid one. Uh, so as sort of pagans and Christians can completely share this festival, because it's part of the same great story. So if you want to lean into the old ways a little bit more at this
this time of year. Uh, bring something evergreen into your house. A uh, holly, ivy. Obviously, these days we normally use a fir tree. That is in, uh, an idea imported from Germany uh, in about the 19th century, uh, I believe. I think around in, in the medieval time in, in England, it would have been it would have been a holly tree we would have brought in. Um, but this goes right back to Roman times, right back to the medieval period probably further back as well, bringing something evergreen into your house and then taking it outside again and uh, perhaps burning it. Um, a Yule log. Uh, I've cut a Yule log this year. I do one every year. Go and harvest a bit of wood if you've got a local forest where you can do that. Um, in Scotland, interestingly, uh, the Yule log is cut into the shape of an old woman, the Kaliach, who is again a uh, <laughs> A bit like Father Christmas, the embodiment of winter, uh, the crone aspect of the sacred feminine that um, is sacrificially burnt at this time of year. Again, to give way for the new, to give way to the, the virgin child coming in spring. But other things you can do, brew your own ale and give it to someone or share it. Share, spend time with family and friends and get drunk. Literally, there is a very old precedent for doing this. Um, I've brewed my own ale this year. I'll be sharing it around my friends and family. Um, my friend Jason gave me this mead a few um, weeks ago. Very traditional thing to drink at this time of year. Uh, also, give an offering to your loved ones that have departed, because this is a time of the dead as well, as well as Halloween, as well as Samhain. My mum passed away last year. Uh, she was from a long line of West Country farmers and she carried a lot of the old ways with her. And I, I, I'm just scratching my brains both last year and this year now to think of all the things she used to do because it was all just little, little, little old traditional things she used to do that just used to make Christmas. Um, the Scandinavians have a very good word for this. The Danish, I should say, hygge, when something's hoogly. Um, Christmas is a very hoogly time, it's very cosy. Light candles, light a fire, get a Yule log, drink alcohol, uh, make a feast. And also uh, play games, play tricks on each other. That's a, that's a, a traditional way of um, uh, inverting the social order, uh, just throwing chaos out there. That's a very, very Yule thing to do. Play tricks on your friends, play tricks on your loved ones. You are honouring the old ones. Um, yeah, so drink, be merry, uh, give gifts to one another. That's a very, that's a very, uh, that's a very old tradition. Um, sing, sing carols, a lot of old pagan symbolism in carols, and uh, just have a bloody good time. But remember those that have passed over, and remember sun the sun is coming back <laughs> uh, as usual at this time of year it's a very rambling video if you want to see my rambling video i made last year about the pagan origins of the yule man or father christmas or um santa claus or some of the pagan origins i'll put a link there or if you want to hear my story sir gawain and the green knight which is a traditional story to tell at this time of year i'll put it there so two options for you my friends good yule